right, if you want to stand and greet your neighbor, we'll get started here. In a Aha, there we are. Okay, good morning. Uh, I'd like to welcome any visitors that are here this morning. Uh, do we have any announcements? Got one. Good morning. We have meat canning this week. All ready to go? I'm going to pass this clipboard around. There's set up here for food and also for volunteers. Thursday morning, we need four volunteers by 4.45 to get started. On Friday morning, we need six because we'll have cans from the day before that will be ready to be labeled. Now that now, it's pretty much self-explanatory. And <clears throat> when it comes around, why well, they get back to me, why well, hopefully it's all filled up. Thank you. All right, um, don't forget to sign up in the back in the middle. Uh, Trivia with a Side of Mystery is next Sunday evening at 5 in the Fellowship Hall. I've been told it's an event that you cannot miss, so sign up. It'll be a blast. Um, any other announcements this morning? All righty. Well, we'll pray for offering uh, pastor support. Um, God, thank you for um, blessing us with today, uh, and thank you for just giving us the ability to be here and worship you. We just want to thank you in particular for our pastors and all the hard work um, that they do for us. Um, they come prepared every Sunday for us and um, give, them, give us a message that, that you lead them to um, give us. We just want to um, praise them and praise you, and just um, thank you for everything that you do. In your name I pray, amen. Alrighty, so this this week I was hearing about some scams going on at the York Hospital. Um, I've been getting some scam texts on my phone, um, calls, all that kind of stuff. Um, I'm sure everybody here has had their qu- warranty on their car expire recently, um, so you probably got those calls as well. Um, and it got me thinking. As Christians, do we speak up when needed, or are we being lazy workers, uh, maybe scammers of God? Um, A couple weeks ago, I caught myself, um, a coworker had called me, and I answered the phone, and we were talking about uh, a work topic, and then she, just out of the blue, she says, are you religious? And my initial response, I don't know why, but yeah, kind of. Why would I say yeah, kind of? So she started to talk a little bit more, and I said, hold on, hold on, hold on. I said, yes, I am religious. I believe in God. I don't know why I said kind of. And she said, did you feel bad? I said, yeah, I felt bad. That's why I corrected myself. And so um, I got down a little bit on myself, but then um, I was reading the Bible in a year, and I got to Peter. Peter did the same exact thing. A disciple of of Jesus, right-hand man, you could say one of Jesus' ride-or-die people, um, and 
Jesus said, you're going to deny me three times before um, the rooster crows. And he did. And so not that that made me feel better, but it made me feel a little bit better. Um, and just thought, are we lazy workers? Are we, are we always scamming God, for lack of a better word? If people ask us about Jesus or about God, what do we say? Or do we just kind of deflect and move on to the next topic? Um, I, I know some other people have had um, incidents in that in the past. We've, I've talked to some people as well about it. And yeah, we get in the word and yes, or we should get in the word or we could get in the word or maybe we get in the word or my, we might get in the word every day. Um, but while we're reading, are we following what we're reading with action? Because that's another way to scam God for lack of a better word. Are we showing everybody grace? Are we lying but I will, I'll just lie just this one time. I'll just lie. It's not going to impact anybody else. I'll just um, lust this one time. It's not going to hurt anybody else. It's just, just one time. Um, are we going to de deny Jesus? Uh, it's, just, it's just this one time. Why would we do it just this one time? Um, so I, just, I got to a couple of verses here um, that I was reading in the Bible in a year. And it re they really stuck out to me just about following up with action. Yes, we're in the word, but are we following up with action? And let's see here. I have quite a few. So um, James 1, 23, 24. Anyone who listens to the word but does not do what it says is like someone who looks at his face in the mirror and after looking at himself goes away and immediately forgets what he looks like. Oops. Took me all the way to the bottom. I'm sorry. James 2.17. In the same way, faith by itself is not accompanied by action. It is dead. Again, it took me to the bottom. I don't know why it's doing this. But some will say, you have faith, I have deeds. Show me your faith without deeds, and I will show you my faith by my deeds. You believe that there is one God, good. Even the demons believe that and shudder. You see that a person is considered righteous by what they do and not by faith alone. Therefore, anyone who rejects the instruction does not reject a human being, but God, the very God who gives his Holy Spirit. He will punish those who do not know God and do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. All of those stuck out to me. Jesus never denied us. He get, he's giving us the opportunity to get to, the, to, get to heaven um, for eternal salvation. Why do we continue to deny him if, if, if you do? Why do we continue to scam, for lack of a better word, um, when he never did that to us? Even though you may think that that lie, that denial, that lust, the greediness, the, the selfishness, the, all of that kind of stuff just happens once, maybe not, may not impact somebody, it does. Are you going to continue to be a scammer or a lazy worker? Or are you going to let your actions guide others to the salvation that you were promised? All righty. That's all that I got. Let's uh, stand up. Let's praise God. How great is our God. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Travel. 
trembles at his voice. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God.
last song this morning, Jesus Paid It All. I hear the Savior say, Thy strength indeed is small. Child of weakness, watch and pray. Find in me thine all in all. Jesus paid it all, all to him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Now, now indeed I find thy Good morning. I want to take the opportunity to greet you in Jesus' name this morning. I'm glad you're all here. I welcome anyone visiting with us. I know there's a number of people that I saw walk in that I don't normally see, but we're, we're thankful that you're here to worship with us, and so we ask you just take an active part in our worship. We just want to lift up the name of Jesus this morning. What a week. We've had quite a swing in weather, which is normal for Nebraska, but I think this past week it's been quite a, a lot of difference, but, and then, you know, you gained an hour. Did you take advantage of that hour? 
Somebody said no. <laughs> you know, we did a little bit. I mean, we don't normally do this, but as we were sitting there and we had a little bit of our devotion time this morning and Gloria said, hey, I've been wanting to read something to you out of this book. And so, of course, we weren't early to church because we took advantage of doing some of the extra stuff. But the things that she read to me out of that, um, wow, I felt like I had church. But when we come into God's house and I look at, you know, the, I think a lot of the bulletin is just full of what we're got, we've got going on this week. Uh, it's probably a pretty good week to have an extra hour. Right, meet canning committee and uh, missions committee and all the stuff that's going on. So I'm looking forward to that. I want to just draw your attention too to one of the announcements in the bulletin about next week. Last Sunday, we had said that we're going to have an abbreviated Sunday school. Well, in talking with the, the length of the presentation and with uh, Brother Ken that's going to be sharing the message as well, we're not going to have Sunday school at all next week. That's in your bulletin. But church will still start at 930, okay? We'll start with praise and worship, announcements, prayer time, just like normal. And then we'll give him a, a block of time. We'll split that up with a little break in the middle, and then we'll end up with him having the remainder of the service. So just so you're, you're reminded of that. And don't forget about the opportunity that we have um, to come to an extra session in the fellowship hall Saturday evening. Um, I think you'll be blessed. So I guess I could have shared that as we were asked for announcements. I, kn I knew you, I was going to be getting, getting up here. When I think of the busyness of the season, of the busyness of this week, I'm just glad that we can take time now and come before God and be quiet and say, Lord, what do you want to give me this morning so that what I face this week, I can do it as a child of you would? Or we've got that opportunity. Sometimes the things that we face... Um, we talked about identity in Sunday school and who I identify with and who I identify as. And sometimes we need to be reminded of who we belong to. Hey, Kyle, are we going to have like a missionary day option next Sunday? Or did we talk about this? We talked about it. If you remember, we were going to have the, the regular missions offering. And then out of that, you guys were going to decide what to give to Brother Ken. Okay, so if you want to think about that, if you want to put a little bit extra in the missions offering next Sunday, that would be super, but that's kind of how we left it, so. I want to continue on this morning going through the book of Daniel, and I don't know that there's been a book that I've preached out of that has been a little bit more challenging, but I finally got to Daniel 6, and one of the commentaries that I refer to a lot as a default setting, goes to the book of Daniel every time I open it up. And on my computer, or on the iPad, or whatever, it goes to Daniel chapter 7 every single time. And I haven't got there yet, but I thought, you know, as I was starting in the book of Daniel, I thought, you know, there's a reason why I'm always um, guided <clears throat> to the middle of Daniel. And today we're going to go through, through Daniel chapter 6. And just by way of review, remember this book of Daniel was written by Daniel with the help of God in reminding us the things that Daniel and his friends as exiles in Babylon went through. And we sense ma many themes as we've gone through the book of Daniel. We're going to get that to that at the end of the message today. And the, the title for the message today is Addressing the King. And... This goes with all the characters that are in this story. And this story is so very familiar. Um, I probably wouldn't even need to read it. But there, when, when I read through it this morning, even when I sat down there and was going through my notes again, I thought, you know, every single word matters. And so I think it's very important that we, that we read this. But as we think of Daniel, we remember in the first chapter, he stood, wasn't at home. But he took a stand to stand for what God wanted him to do. 
He was also the revealer of a couple dreams to Nebuchadnezzar. He was a revealer the last time I preached to the king Belshazzar that was after Nebuchadnezzar with the writing on the wall. And then we come to this, this chapter. We know that the, at the end of that chapter, Belshazzar, remember he had drank wine from the, the cups that were taken from Jerusalem brought back into captivity to Babylon, and they wanted to have a party. There were the Medes and the Persians on the outside of the city going to try to attack them to get in, and he wanted to forget about it. He said, you know, this is a good idea. Let's have a party. And we know what the writing on the wall says, that, you know what? Pride is not a good issue. I think the issue of pride throughout the book of Daniel is really first and foremost. It really is. And so as I thought of that, we know at the very end, that very night, Belshazzar's life was, was taken. The Medes and the Persians attacked. They got in the city, they attacked, and they took over. And Darius, the Mede, was made king. And that brings us to Daniel chapter 6. So if you want to put Daniel 6 up there, I'm going to read through this, this chapter. Like I said, very familiar. Verse 1. It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 satraps to be over the whole kingdom and over these three governors of whom Daniel was one that the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. Then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps because an excellent spirit was in him and the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. So the governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault, because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. Then these men said, We shall not find any charge against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators and the satraps, the counselors and advisors, have consulted together to establish a royal statute and to make a firm decree that whoever petitions any god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into a, the den of lions. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed according to the law of the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written dec decree. Now, when Daniel knew that the writing was signed, he went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. Then these men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God. And they went before the king and spoke concerning the king's decree. Have you not signed a decree that every man who petitions any god or man within thirty days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions? The king answered and said, the thing is true, according to the law of Medes, the Medes and Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Daniel, who is one of the captives from Judah, does not show regard for you, O king, or for the decree that you have signed, but makes his petition three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself, and set his heart on Daniel to deliver him, and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. Then these men approached the king and said to the king, Know, O king, that it is the law of the Medes and the Persians that no decree or statute with the king, which the king establishes may be changed. So the king gave the command, and they brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying to Daniel, Your God, whom you serve continually, he will deliver you. Then a stone was brought and laid on the mouth of the den, and the king sealed it with his own signet ring and with the signets of the Lord's that the purpose concerning Daniel might not be changed. Now the king went to his palace and spent the night fasting, and no musicians were brought before him, and his sleep went from him. Then the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. And when he came to the den, he cried out with a lamenting voice to Daniel. The king spoke, saying to Daniel, Daniel, servant of the living God, has your God, whom you serve continually, been able to deliver you from the lions? Then Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. My God sent his angel and shut the lion's mouths so that they have not hurt me because I was found innocent before him and also, O king, I have no, done no wrong before you. 
Now the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the den. So Daniel was taken up out of the den and no injury whatever was found on him because he believed in his God. And the king gave the command and they brought these men who had accused Daniel and they cast them into the den of lions, them, their children and their wives and the lions overpowered them and brought, broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the den. Then King Darius wrote to all peoples, nations and languages that dwell in all the earth, peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel, for he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth. Who has delivered Daniel from the power of the lions? So this Daniel prospered in the reign of Darius and in the reign of Cyrus the Persian. Like I said, you've heard that story since forever. I wonder how many times you've heard that story. When I went through that this week, I thought, you know, what? God, there's got to be something new in here, something, something that we hadn't thought of before. And, well, we'll see. But what a story. What a piece of drama. Um, this Darius just took over the reign here. He was the Mede. And Babylon had fallen to the Medes and the Persians. Belshazzar was dead. Here was Darius. And he comes up with a plan. Something that pleased him. Something that he had thought about. That verse 1 says, It pleased Darius to set over the kingdom 120 men called satraps. And that word is princes. So 120 men. And over these 120 men, he put three administrators or governors. So much like the government we have now. You've got you know, local government. You've got state government. You've got national government. And you've got your layers of authority. And here at the top, we have King Darius. Now, remember when Belshazzar called Daniel in and he says, hey, you can tell me what the writing on the wall was. I'll make you number three in the nation. Right? That lasted till that evening when he died. That's about how fleeting this life is. But when Darius took over this, as a Mede, as the king, he set these 120 men up for a certain purpose. Much like government today is set up, it's got a purpose. And there's authority behind it. Over these three governors whom Daniel was one. So Daniel was in this new government now. Okay, so remember Daniel, as a young boy, was taken as an exile, as a captive, brought to Babylon, infused with Babylonian culture, and God showed favor to him throughout his life. Wherever we find Daniel, we find him in a place of leadership. And this is no exception. Again, 120 men over the whole king, kingdom. And then he picks out these three guys to be over them for a particular reason. That the satraps might give account to them so that the king would suffer no loss. In other words, these 120 men reported to the three governors, the three administrators, so that the king wouldn't suffer any loss. A loss as far as what is my question? Money? Probably. Um, loyalty? More likely. Power? Remember, he's just establishing his kingdom. So there was a reason why Darius thought, and it pleased him, say, I'm, you know what, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make these 120 men out of whole the kingdom, and then over these, I'm going to put these three administrators so that the king would suffer no loss. Verse 3, then this Daniel distinguished himself above the governors. How many governors were there? Three. So Daniel again shined. Remember back in chapter 1 when Daniel said, you know what, we're not going to eat the king's meat. We're going to eat the pulse, the vegetables. Bring that stuff in. We're not going to drink the... We're, we're, going to, we're going to do what God would want us to do. If we were at home, that's what we want to do here. Hey, let's have a test. At the end of the test, who, was, who shined? 
Daniel and his friends. There was a reason beyond the foodstuffs. Okay? And there's a reason here that, again, Daniel separates himself from the other two people that were in leadership. And that just gives us that, that phrase. Daniel distinguished himself above the governors and the satraps. Why? Because an excellent spirit was in him. Where do you think that spirit came from? Uh, he was just a good old guy, right? Kerwin, you're a very good guy. If you wouldn't have Jesus, you wouldn't be that guy. That's every one of us. You know, we can, we can be a moral person. We can be a good person. We can be a good father. We can be a great grandpa. We can be a wonderful business person. We can treat everybody fairly. We can have high standards. And if we don't have Christ, we're not Daniels. Daniel had an excellent spirit because he had God's spirit. And it was evident from chapter 1 now to chapter 6 and on through the rest of the book. He had an excellent spirit and the king gave thought. In other words, King Darius took notice of this man. There's something different about that Daniel. He had an excellent spirit. He gave thought to setting the whole kingdom under him. Okay, so remember Belshazzar said, you know, I can make you number three. Why? Because he was a co-king. So that, a kingship wasn't Belshazzar's to give. But he said, Daniel, I can make you number three. Well, then we come to here, and there's King Darius, the new king. And he sets up these 120 men, and three men above them. And the best one who shined above all was Daniel. And the king gave thought, and it must have not have been a secret. Because we go on here. The, the king gave thought to say, you know what? I really think of those three. Daniel should be the leader. Verse 4. So the governors and satraps sought to find some chart. Wait. And the king gave thought to setting him over the whole realm. But we have a so there. Uh, verse 4 says so. When you have... A new leadership, when you have a new government, when you have a new king, and he sets up all the people that trickle down underneath him. Okay, he's going to pick those people that hopefully, hopefully are loyal to who? To him. But that's not how it always works. Because see, in, in all the workings of administration and government, no matter where you are, You've got people that are set up in places of leadership that think that they should be over Joe Schmo on the next group. And that's exactly what this was. This wasn't a thing that, you know, how can we do the best for the king? No. This was in, what do we have to do to get rid of Daniel? The governors and satraps sought to find some charge against Daniel concerning the kingdom, but they could find no charge or fault. Because he was faithful, nor was there any error or fault found in him. We are just about to Tuesday, November 8th, 2022, midterm elections. Am I right? All you hear is someone out there saying what they can do for you. Or the state of Nebraska, or the country of the United States of America. That has been projected. And the Medes and the Persians don't have anything on this, on where we are today. I thought about, I sat there, I thought, well, isn't that exactly what it is? You can't turn the television on, you can't listen to the radio without hearing somebody say what they can do. And not even only what they can do, but what the other guy failed to do before. But these people had a problem because they wanted to get rid of Daniel, but guess what? Daniel wasn't negligent, he did his job well. The king took notice of him. When it come to getting things done, Daniel was the guy. Why? Because everything Daniel set his heart to do, God's spirit guided him. That's huge. No fault in Daniel. He was faithful. You think the king knew that? Of course he did. No error. No skeletons. 
You've all heard, well, remember, you know, you hear people project themselves by putting someone else down. And that doesn't even need to be in politics. That's human nature. Remember what he did when he was young, Les? You remember that? Like I said before, who you are goes with you till you die and then beyond. But of Daniel, they found no fault. You know, that excellent spirit that Daniel had is really a question that we need to ask ourselves this morning. Do I have that spirit? Am I letting my relationship with Jesus Christ, you know, when I'm baptized and I receive the gift of the Holy Spirit, and God says, now I want you to go, and I want that to be your guide. I'm going to bring these things to your, your, your mind. I'm going to touch other people through you so that they know that you are like Daniel. You have that excellent spirit. And you know, much like Daniel, we need to let that spirit affect every one of our relationships. And I had to think about that. We've got a couple couples in this congregation that have just been married. And when we go through those premarital classes, uh, one of the very first things we, we try to explain, and, and they get it, is that your relationship with Christ is so big that it will affect everything else in every relationship you have. And Daniel knew that. His relationship with his God, which was very, very consistent, affected all of the, the, the dealings with the people that were around him. They knew beyond a doubt. And so our marriages, that, that will come in a better way when I'm connected more with Christ. My job, the people I work with, the people in the community, strangers I meet. Every relationship I have is going to be affected by that spirit. It did for Daniel. It'll do it for me, too. These men said, we're not going to find anything against this Daniel unless we find it against him concerning the law of his God. May that be our testimony. May the only thing that people can find fault with us, and that's in the Bible. May the only thing that people can find fault with us, and, and that's really not a fault, is our relationship with Jesus Christ. What a, they thought it was a loophole. I see it as a strength. They thought it was a gotcha. You know what I mean? Wait a minute. There it is. That's our in. So these governors and satraps thronged before the king and said thus to him, King Darius, live forever. Now, when they said that, we've talked about that before because that was the culture back then. You went into the presence of the king. You were addressing the king. Live forever. Did he? Well, no, he's not here. Did they mean it? Well, let's look at the motive for them coming to address the king. Did they want Darius to have the best? No. No. Simply not. They wanted self-promotion. I would have, you know how that is. In your minds, I, you, you kind of think, were they not, was the king who was pretty good at reading people? He could read Daniel. Was he not pretty good at reading these people? Or did he, did he like what they said? Because they knew how to get to king. They knew how to address the king. They said this, all the governors of the kingdom. Wait a minute, wait, wait, wait. All the governors? So you mean Daniel was in that group that came up with this thing? Uh, no. First of all, they started off with the blatant lie. You know, we were talking about uh, finding truth in the world today, and you don't know who to trust. Now, I, I believe I can trust you guys, okay? I believe I can trust God's word always. But when you go out in the world today, really, fine-tooth comb, uh, that needs to come into play a lot. Everything must go through the sieve of God's word. And then you're okay. 
All the governors of the kingdom, the administrators, the satraps, the counselors, and advisors have consulted together to establish a royal statute and make a firm decree that whoever petitions a god or man for 30 days except you, O king, shall be cast into the den of lions. Why would the king go for that? Well, we said, okay, just establishing his kingdom, wants to have the loyalty of the people. Hmm. Now, the people didn't come up there and say, hey, you know what? We're going to make that statue 90 foot tall again and 9 foot wide. And everybody needs to, it's going to be of you, Darius, now. And you can all, we can hear the music and we can fall down. No. We're just, no, simply, king. O king, live forever. Why don't we just make a law? Let's just make a law. Anybody who petitions or asks or prays to any man or any deity... For 30 days, why they put 30 days, I don't know. I guess they knew Daniel. They knew Daniel with as consistent as he was. You think they didn't know that he prayed every single day, three times a day, with his windows open toward Jerusalem? Yeah, they knew that. It wasn't going to take 30 days. It was going to take three hours. Slick. Slick. Now, O king, establish the decree and sign the writing so that it cannot be changed, according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. Therefore, King Darius signed the written decree. He said, hey, sounds good to me. Let's get it rolling. Where was his train of thought? Well, who did it project? Except you, O king. Nobody can petition anybody or pray to anybody but you, O king. And here we get to pride again. 30 days. Establish it. Make it. Sign it. It'll be law. And then you know what? The Medes and the Persians had the law that if, if the king signed it, if he made a decree and he signed it, it could not be changed. They, they thought of themselves so highly that they were almost God. Okay. Okay. Does God's law change? Never will. It never will. Did Darius' law change? Didn't take too long, did it? Quite a com contrast there. We consulted together. We think that this would be a good idea, King. And he signed it. He signed it. Daniel found out about it. When Daniel knew that the writing was signed, what did he do? He did these things. He went home, and in his upper room, with his windows open toward Jerusalem, he knelt down on his knees three times when? You know, at the end of 30 days. No. Three times that day. That's not giving too much thought to what's going to happen. You know what? That decree had a consequence that was going to happen. When? Immediately. Immediately. He got on his knees three times that day and prayed and gave thanks before his God, as was his custom since early days. You know, ever since he could decide that God is my God. God is my God. Since that time, that was his custom. He went home. He went upstairs. He went down on his knees, threw open the windows, and he prayed. I don't know the significance of all that, but I think as his custom was, pray without ceasing. You think it was just three times a day Daniel prayed? No, I don't think so. I think in this position, it was three times a day. God doesn't limit how many times we can come to him. Because of what Jesus did on the cross, I shoot up a prayer. I was walking up the steps this morning. I thought, Here I go. Lord, help me. That's normal. When you face anything, you're going to face not even a law that's made, but something that you see that you shouldn't see. I did this week. It's so out there. And it stops, it should stop you. Lord, cleanse my vision. Just Help me. 
Shoot up that prayer. We're not limited. He's right there. These men assembled and found Daniel praying and making supplication before his God, and they knew they would. They knew what would happen. They went before the king and asked him, Hey, didn't you sign that thing? Didn't you sign that decree? You know what? You remember that? That that law can't be changed? The king answered, The thing is true according to the law of the Medes and the Persians, which does not alter. So they answered and said before the king, That Dan, uh, Daniel? You know, he, they didn't use his Babylonian name, Belteshazzar. They didn't use that. They used his Hebrew name. Why? Because they didn't want to identify him now as Babylonian. They want, he's one of those exiles. One of those people that was captured by the Babylonians and brought back to be infused with their, their culture. That Daniel is one of the captives from Judah, and he does not show due regard for you, O king. And wait a minute, there's another blatant lie. Now, did he say no to the king's edict? Yes. Did he show no due regard? No. There is a difference. You know, we are to honor those in authority above us. We are to pray for them. If we are instructed to blatantly go against God's word, do we get this clearly? We have a higher authority to bow to. Daniel knew that. The decision for Daniel was easy. Why? Because he didn't wait until he was in crisis mode to make it. As his custom was, that's what he did. Three times a day. And the king, when he heard these words, was greatly displeased with himself. He didn't get mad. He didn't get upset with those people that had come in there. He looked in the mirror. Huh. That's kind of a little refreshing, isn't it? He figured it out. Oh, these people played me. They played on my pride. They played on my ego. When they came in and said, you know, we came up with this because I think it'd be really good. Uh, there's a reason. And it wasn't for the benefit of King Darius. So he set his heart on Daniel to deliver him and he labored till the going down of the sun to deliver him. He tried hard. He tried all day into the evening to get out of what he'd signed. And there was simply no way. There are times when a decision that I've made a wrong decision I've made. I've absolutely painted myself. If I was over here and I could take this carpet back and I could have a paintbrush and a can of paint and I could paint myself into a corner, there's absolutely no way I can get out of it but up. And Darius didn't have that option. Because when he talked to the people about Daniel, he said, Daniel's God. We have to make Daniel's God our God. I can't just say, well, because mom and dad believed in God, that's good enough for me. Or because Pastor Kyle or Pastor Brad says, we need to believe in God, well, that's good enough for... No! This is my God. These men approached the king. No, O king, it's the law. It can't be changed. So the king gave the command. They brought Daniel and cast him into the den of lions. But the king spoke, saying, Daniel, your God... Whom you serve continually, he's able to deliver you. He will deliver you. That was like a statement of faith, wasn't it? You serve him continually. And from chapter 1 all the way through, Daniel delivered. Daniel delivered. The Hebrew boys delivered. Verse 17, a stone was brought and laid at the mouth of the den. And I looked up that word den this morning. Because I thought, you know what? What really did that mean? The, in the original wording, it means a pit for wild animals. A pit. That means a hole. And if you read the wording, it, that's exactly what it means. Because when they put the stone on, they put the stone on top. They sealed it then with the king's signet ring. It was a hole with wild lions in it 
that Daniel was thrown down in there. They put the stone on and they sealed it with the king's signet ring and the signets of the other lords. It was sealed. The stone was brought, laid on the mouth of the den, and it was sealed, and it looked like Daniel's fate. Obviously, it was sealed, right? Lions. Hungry. And you know what? Daniel's fate was sealed. Because no matter if those lions would have crushed him and ate him, consumed him, Daniel's fate was sealed. No matter what we face, no matter what law we face, no matter where we are, if we go home and we throw up the, open the windows and we fall to our knees and we lift up our eyes and we pray and we thank, our fate is sealed. Do we understand that no matter what we face, no matter what happens Tuesday or two years from now, trust. The king went to his palace and spent the night fasting. Fasting just means you stop doing something. He fasted and there was no food to eat. Didn't go to grab the popcorn, nothing. No musicians to come in, no entertainment. He also fasted from sleep. He couldn't sleep. Could you sleep? Would you sleep? Verse 19, the king arose very early in the morning and went in haste to the den of lions. Very early in the morning. And you know, right away I got a picture in the last chapter of the book of Luke. When those women went on the first day of the week to anoint the body of Jesus. And when did they go? Very early in the morning. They went to the tomb that was sealed with a stone. And on the way, if you read in Mark, they was asking the question, who's going to remove that stone? Well, here we know that King Darius said, move that stone. He cried out, Daniel, was your God able to deliver you? Daniel said to the king, O king, live forever. And he meant it. How he addressed the king is brought out in that next verse. My God sent his angel to shut the lion's mouth so that they have not hurt me. And then he gives the reason why. Because I was found innocent before God. I made my call. And also, O king, I have done no wrong before you. And you know what, Darius? You know it. You know it. It's, ev it's, it's evident. And the king was exceedingly glad for him and commanded that they should take Daniel up out of the pit. Up. So Daniel was taken up out of the den, and no injury whatever was found on Daniel. Why? Because he believed in his God. The king gave command, and they brought those men who had accused Daniel, and they cast them in the den of lions. Wait a minute. What? You know, when I thought about that, these people came in, these 120 men, and I don't know how many of them were with them, but it had to be quite a group because... The wording was thronged. When they assembled, they thronged together. Now what happened? They devised an evil scheme. And you think about that. When I thought about devising an evil scheme, I look at that first part of that word, devised, and it's like D-E-V-I, and I think of the devil. Because, see, we have a lion that pursues us that wants to trip us, that wants us to end up in the pit that he will. The king gave command, and not only, I appreciate what Aaron shared this morning, not only were these men thrown into the den, but their wives and their kids. You say, where was the justice in that? See, we don't sin to ourselves. When I fall, when I fail, it affects everyone around me. Daniel knew that. 
When they were thrown in, the lions overpowered them and broke all their bones in pieces before they ever came to the bottom of the pit. You know what? Justice will be served. One day, those that have done evil, that have not counted on Jesus to save them, will be thrown into the pit. Not because God wants it that way. Because they haven't trusted in the only remedy to not be. And that's Christ. I was just amazed at how many similarities you can see in this story and the story of when Jesus was falsely accused. You know, these people didn't have anything to find against Daniel. Not one thing except, oh, maybe we can catch him in something with his God. Isn't that the picture of Christ? They couldn't find one thing bad about him. So they had to have people give false testimony. And Darius then at the end follows the pattern of Daniel all the way throughout. Daniel stood. The Hebrew boy stood. Daniel stood. Daniel stood. Daniel stood. And every single time, God delivered, God delivered, God delivered. And at the end, what happened? Exactly what happened at the end of this chapter. God is glorified. God is glorified. God is glorified. And as people that are his, that's our goal. No matter if we're in the pit, and that's quite a pit. Darius wrote this, peace be multiplied to you. Wrote it to everybody. All peoples, nations, languages that dwell in the earth. That let anybody out? Peace be multiplied to you. I make a decree that in every dominion of my kingdom, men must tremble and fear before the God of Daniel. For he is the living God and steadfast forever. His kingdom is the one which shall not be destroyed and his dominion shall, not, shall endure to the end. He delivers and rescued rescues and he works signs and wonders in heaven and on earth who has delivered de who has delivered daniel from the power of the lions so this daniel prospered in the reign of Dar darius and in the reign of cyrus the persian what a pattern we see in the book of daniel a pattern of being willing to be what god asked me to be you know i thought about that when i was studying was Daniel perfect? Because do you read anything in here that would say that he wasn't? He wasn't. He needed a savior just like I do. Just like you do. But he made the choice to belong to God. We have that choice. Like Darius, who said these words, Daniel, was your God able? Oh, Daniel, the God you serve continually, your God, he will deliver you. Was Darius a saved person? Well, read what he said. He's the living God. That's pretty much a declaration, right? We must make our relationship with Christ personal. We decide for ourselves. God gives each of us a choice and each of us an invitation. He says, serve me. Doesn't matter if you're in Babylon, doesn't matter if you're in Seward, or you're in Milford, or you're in Friend, or you're in wherever. He invites you to serve me. God says, love me. He says, honor me. He says, pray to me. Ask me. Speak for me. Come to me. Jesus says, believe in me. And Jesus says, rest in me. And our fate is sealed. We have a big job to do. It doesn't stop today 
It isn't magnified on Tuesday or the next week or the next week or the next year. It's every single day. And when I thought about that, about what Daniel did, when he knew that the writing was signed, what did he do? What he always did. His go-to. Go home. Open the windows toward Jerusalem. Kneel down. And pray. And God will make it clear to you what you need to do. Because that excellent spirit that was in Daniel, that guides us today. Daniel's God, who rolled away that stone from Jesus' tomb and shut the mouths of the lions, that's our God. I was just finished with preparing this yesterday morning and Emerson was at our house, and the chorus that came to me was what Daniel did. The windows of heaven are open. The blessings are falling tonight. There's joy, joy, joy in my soul. Why? Since Jesus made everything right. We've got the opportunity to share that hope, just like Darius did. All peoples, nations, languages, everybody we meet. Are you willing? Let's pray. Father, we just thank you for this old, old story that really for me this week just took on new meaning. Lord, I want to do what you asked me to do. Would you guide me so much with your Holy Spirit that I don't have to wait to the middle of a crisis to kind of come up with a plan, that I know how I'm going to react because of what Jesus has done for me on that cross. And I want my life to count for him. And it's in his name we pray. Amen. Larry, you want to lead us in that chorus? bow for the benediction. Now may the God of peace who brought up our Lord Jesus from the dead, that great shepherd of the sheep through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you complete in every good work to do his will, working in you what is well-pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. Amen.